How are you guys doing? Good? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, so let's see if this is going to work. Hi. Uh, thank you to the Gray Area organizers and everyone for coming to my talk today. Uh, sometimes I feel like talking about our work uh, can be a bit tricky. I don't know if you guys feel the same way. Uh, however, here at events like Gray Area Festival, I feel like we have this camaraderie of investigation, which in turn creates a common language uh, that makes it easier to sort of share the work and talk about it. So it's a huge honor to uh, be here today, and, uh, and I've been looking forward to it a lot. I've been fascinated by spaces like this, uh, because to me, they represent invention. It means that whether you're an artist, developer, designer, engineer, or startup, uh, this is a shared space of people that are inventing a practice, a model, and an idea. And that you're here means you're a part of a community that supports that. Uh, my name is Su Gwen. I'd like to tell you a few stories today and share some inspirations. Uh, but I warn you that linearity is really not my strong suit at all. So maybe you can tell that already. Uh, but we're in this together. Hopefully it remains on course. So I was recently following the story about Lisa Dahl, the top-ranking Go player in the world. Lisa Dahl, this brave human, uh, faced off with AlphaGo, a computer program, uh, in five historic matches. It was completely riveting. And on a personal note, my family plays Go and kind of have understood the intricacy of the game a little bit. And it really struck me always as a complex and intuitive game and process. So for the uninitiated, the game YK, or Go, as it's been appropriated, um, is an abstract strategy board game for two players. It's ancient and originated in China over 2,500 years ago. So Lee Sedol is facing off with AlphaGo, and spoiler alert, Lee Sedol lost four to one, and not good odds. Um, I don't think I was alone in being a bit uncomfortable to read that the development comes 10 times sooner than most AI researchers predicted. But here's the twist. The, the top Go players in the world, Lee Sedol included, have said that they see the game entirely differently now. After five months of playing with this, with this system, um, they see the moves they've never seen before. And because of how the system learns from its human players, it functions as a kind of intelligent behavioral mirror that learns alongside who it's playing. And I apologize to all the machine learning researchers in the room for my crude explanation. Uh, I particularly liked this article by Wired writer Cade Metz, who wrote that this event signaled a certain cultural shift, that these exercises are no longer demonstrating this idea of human versus machine, but human and machine. It's not human versus machine, it's human and machine. I thought that was a pretty concise way of articulating this rare point in history we're all in. It's, it was really evocative, and it captured the potential inspiration and anxiety that might flow from that particular dichotomy, human and machine, which is fascinating for me because for years I've been exploring on a level of self-directed creative practice the tensions, trials, and tribulations between what I've been calling the mark made by hand and the mark made by machine. So today I'd like to share some projects that explore those two themes. Um, and rant, before I get ahead of myself, human versus machine, human and machine is definitely a framing. It's a narrative construct, and it's really epic, I think. As a narrative, it produces that sensation that we feel when we look at images of space, for instance. It makes us, as humans, as a species, feel really small and insignificant. And by extension, our issues and petty concerns and problems are insignificant. So I think there's a real liberation there. Uh, the exercise of thinking about human output, for me, attains this level of clarity that I find really inspiring. <laughs> and I think that clarity can be really collectivizing and unifying. Or unifying, uh, that's end rant. Uh, so as humans, we make, we sing, we dance, uh, we draw. I should never sing, but uh, I draw. Our ancestors drew as one of the earliest ex expressions of art in recorded history. Um, I draw, it's been an obsession of mine for some time. I never know what I'm going to draw, but I know good or bad, I just need to do it. 
To borrow from the Fluxus Manifesto for a moment, for me, the output of a drawing is pretty immaterial compared to the inhabitants of the state of drawing. It's really about being in this flow state. So I was curious in the beginning of my career how to explore how software can augment or recontextualize or you know, uh, subvert these creative processes, these flow states. That obsession led me to the Museum of Contemporary Art in Geneva, kind of really randomly, actually. I'd been making these small drawing sculptures in my studio to play around with form and light, uh, and really, they're really simple, straightforward material fixations. Then suddenly, the curator got in touch, and I found myself carrying 30 hand-cut, large-scale drawings, uh, 20 hand-soldered LED lights, and a suitcase full of metal supports, uh, on an airport, in an airport from New York uh, to London to Geneva for my first installation. I'm not sure how they let me on the plane, but it was pretty, it was pretty epic. <laughs> so I arrive in Geneva and kind of harried and wild and got to work. At that point, I was a team of one, meticulously crafting this space, this installation that combined layers of light uh, with paper sculpture and sound in this massive room. I went from the frame of a drawing to the frame of the screen and then back into this physical space without perimeter. In Karaskuru, the viewer could escape into the surreal world of organic and textural form, completely created from imagination. So with this piece, I knew I wanted to create an organic line, light and sound spectacle that enveloped you. I knew that, but what I didn't know it was this is, would that, is that it would be this strange aha moment for me uh, when you have these tools and materials coming together to change the scope of what you thought would be possible. On opening, on opening night, I decided not uh, to step into the drawing and finish the line work in the space uh, as the animation billowed around me. Not because it wasn't finished, but I wanted to introduce the notion of incompleteness into the territory of the installation. When drawing in, in this installation, the power and potency of gesture became very apparent, and I was, became really curious about creating a new environment in which performed gesture controlled everything in a site-specific space. So next came this project called Ectasis. Ectasis is a piece experimenting with the potential of performing architecture. So in this 20 minute piece, a performer, myself, plays and improvises lines of violin from which visual line work flows. A simple pluck of the string as an effector, a tensile vibrato manipulating the light casting on this large scale structure. At the time I'd been reading a little bit of Andy Clark's writings on cognitive extension through gesture and I wanted to channel that spontaneous energy uh, through a violin performance onto this kind of massive space. Using the stylus and the violin as a tool in performance dramatically changed my perspective towards software, in particular towards interface, and established design patterns. One of my favorite things about being at these conferences is getting to know these little stories about how people find their inspiration. Um, and this is one of mine. So I came across this quote from a British curator, Emma Dexter. As the pencil moves about the paper, its path is local and confined. Freed from the need to consider the totality, it can respond immediately to where the hand is now in presentia. That quote really got stuck in my head like a song I can't unhear. What if using our digital tools could feel as natural and as, and as uninhibited as drawing? Freed from the need to consider the totality, the user flow, something less directed, something more meditative. So that impulse led me to this project called Presentia. Presentia is a simple drawing tool that, in, uh, that enables anyone to create 3D printable sculptures shaped entirely by instinctive gesture. Digital sculpture as simple as drawing in collaboration with this guy named Mr. Du. Uh, the tool aims to capture the meditative aspect of drawing and gesture that's often stifled in many digital tools. And I was hoping with this project, I mean, you, we read a lot about the revolution of 3D printing and whatnot, but you realize that it's really for a limited subsect of people who understand how to use the software. I wanted to open it up to everyone of all ages, like, 
kind of all backgrounds. So if you can pick up a stylus, you can make sculpture in this tool. And, and perhaps it's because I don't have a lot of innate talent with code, software, or hardware. Um, but a background and interest in interface and new media and its effects that I spent a long time with this perspective of, you know, the human gesture being the intuitive one and the, the mechanical interface being somehow uh, like a, sort of this other, if that makes any sense. <laughs> So with that perspective, that conflict between human and machine marks uh, was really kind of at the forefront of my brain um, quite broadly. Human and machines represented concepts at polar ends of a spectrum. So I was reading up into the etymological origins of computer, and it's generally just a computational system that produces automation. But to bring you back to my buddy Lisa Dahl and AlphaGo, perhaps what we can learn from these stories um, is that the advances in, in AI are creating a shift between that apparent dichotomy. When I think of artificial intelligence uh, and co the computer today and strides in deep learning and machine learning, I think of the Chinese translation for the computer, which is Dean Lo. It translates directly to electric brain. In 1964, Philip K. Dick asked if androids dreamt of electric sheep. Now in 2016, we might actually get to find out. In art school, I remember encountering the works of German uh, minimalist artist Sol Lewitt. He's usually a crowd favorite. Uh, his most famous pieces are operational diagrams. On a wall surface, any continuous stretch of wall, using a hard pencil, place 50 points at random. The points should be even evenly distributed over the area of the wall, and all of the points should be connected by straight lines instructions for others to execute. I always thought in this procedural nature, it reminded me a bit of lines of code. The work follows a very computational language, eliminating the self-expression of humans in an artwork. So that brings us to today. Today I'd like to talk to you about my latest project, Drawing Operations Unit, Generation One. Today I'd like to talk to you about Doug. So drawing operations is an improvisational drawing collaboration between me and a robotic arm, who I'm named Doug. I've worked with some pretty eccentric characters, but Doug is by far my strangest collaborator to date. Uh, together we started out in New York and went to Austin and most recently got back from Japan uh, doing these performances. I was, really, I was really nervous, but he did great. He kept his servos cool, he didn't break a sweat. That's my robot joke. Um, <laughs> for drawing operations, I want to flip Solowitz's uh, original script on its head a little bit. Instead of humans following mechanical operations, um, I want to try something different. I wanted to tr experiment with machines following human drawing operations. In its initial foray, it's an initial foray into engaging a machine as an artistic collaborator and also a way to participate in the narrative around machine learning within the space of a creative practice. I remember the first time I saw, we were prototyping, I saw Doug like coming to life. It was really amazing. It was like seeing a kid take its first steps and equally awkward. <laughs> so along with my friend Yotam, we started designing the behavior of this strange new collaborator. First, we needed to get it to move. We uploaded noise patterns into its Arduino brain, and let it work its magic. Secondly, we needed to get Doug to see. With the use of a simple web camera and a few cables and the computer, the robot tracks my movement, the movement of my mark via color tracking. Seeing eye Doug was in the building. Thirdly, we programmed the robot to follow. By using a computer vision library called JIT in Max MSP, the robot can recognize the motion of my line and mimic the gesture in real time on the paper as we draw together. These are some of the drawings we've started making. And the project for me is, beyond it being a bit strange, it's an experiment in gestural empathy, a performance of following the leader, follow the leader between human and machine. Um, and in the introduction of an intuitive language of gesture to to a machine, to Doug, with the aim of showing artistic co-creation. 
not human versus machine, but in generation one, human and machine drawing together. In generation two, which I'm really excited about, I'm exploring the space of shared memory. Not only will Doug be able to remember the drawing gestures we've done together in the studio and in performance, I'll be collecting the drawing styles of other people. Um, by collecting these styles of artists and non-artists and everybody, we'll be in effect building a brain of drawing behaviors unique to uh, this robotic arm. And unique to Doug, but available to all. Generation two will be fully open source, and it won't just be me on stage learning how to draw with Doug, but disseminating his robotic brain uh, and design for everyone else to play with. So I found this pretty surprising. In, in many of my other projects, perfection was always the goal, like trying to find the perfect line or form and the perfect interaction. But the surprising thing about this is when, when I've been doing this project, the inaccuracies really become part of the improvisation. It's definitely not a bug, it's a feature. I'll leave you with this. Wait, no, let's just, let's just think about that for a second. Oh, okay. It's, oh yes. Okay, I'll leave you with this. <laughs> you can thank Rachel Binks for that one, by the way. Uh, Moves that AlphaGo make are described by Lee as beautiful, and in the games he's playing, you can see the astonishment on his face. But I think that's just the beginning. Generation, Doug, uh, generation one Doug can move, see, and follow. In forthcoming generations, Doug will be able to remember, recall, and reflect drawings with me and hopefully drawings with all of you. When that happens, I have no idea what he'll draw like, but I'm pretty curious to find out. Thanks. <laughs>